surely due to Martin's teaching, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, first and the last speaker of this afternoon is Stefan von Norin, who will tell us about black holes of that theory. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for the organizer for setting up this meeting. Um, of course, uh, Martin has for me been a great inspiration and uh, we wrote many papers together. I'll talk a little bit more about it towards the end. But uh, I learned basically everything about uh, hyperkähler and quaternionic kähler geometry from Martin. Uh, at the time, uh, well, I was a postdoc here. Uh, but at the time, Martin was one of the very first who started working with Ulf and uh, Nigel and so on, the, on this topic. He was probably looking more uh, like this. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I found a picture that even uh, goes further, but I'm not entirely sure it's, it's you. So this I found this morning, which is you. Which is pro <laughs> so probably the last... Which is uh, probably the last time you were a Thai. Uh, <laughs> But then I, I thought I found another picture where you're also wearing a tie, which was, I think, last year or so when you won a, a very nice prize uh, in uh, Czech Republic, in Prague, I think, huh? uh, for your, basically for your work on geometry and, uh, uh, and physics and supersymmetry. And so uh, wearing a beautiful tie, probably still wearing your sandals underneath, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's still well-deserved. Um, Martin told me, uh, well, even the basic things I learned from Martin, this is a great teacher, uh, the first sort of easy examples of hyperkähler geometries is the top nut geometry. That's a four-dimensional space, and I wrote down the metric here in some coordinates. And so um, um, the top nut uh, uh, geometry is a hyperkähler space that has isometries. It has a U1 cross SU2. The SU2 rotates the complex structures, and the U1 is triholomorphic. Learned all these words from him. Uh, and um, um, so th this metric has a property that uh, the, this, the, 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 the phi coordinate is, is actually is a circle coordinate. And so the topology uh, actually uh, um, is that of R3 cross S1, especially at, at infinity. It's a, it's a vibration. And when you're close to the origin, there's a harmonic, harmonic function here. Close to the origin, it looks more like a flat space time, R4. And if you have a nut charge of uh, uh, M, then in fact uh, you, you develop uh, singularities which you can resolve by, by having multi centers. And the stop nut geometry is going to uh, play an important role in my story later on. In fact, this, this particular statement about interpolating between R4 and R3 cross S1 is going to allow me to go from uh, black holes in five dimensions to black holes in four dimensions uh, uh, by using this top nut trick. So just keep, keep this trick in mind. Well, it's not a trick, it's a fact. Uh, and I will use it later on. Also, the fact that we have this U1 cause SU2 isometries uh, is going to uh, be important. So my talk is going to be about black holes. Uh, and, uh, well, before that, uh, the top nut geometries preserve supersymmetry in string theory, and you can use them uh, also as backgrounds uh, or solutions to the supergravity equations of motions. If you're in 11-dimensional supergravity, you can construct these geometries, so Calabio compactifications down to, uh, down to 5 if you start in 11, and then uh, time times top nut. I'll be also talking about F-theory. Now, I, I know as well, or, or not even as well, what F-theory is as, as Warren. So I'll be, whenever I use the word F-theory, you have to see, think, have in mind that it's evidence for F-theory. So I, 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 I use the word in the spirit of the original papers by, by Vafa and Vafa Morrison. Uh, but also, I will, uh, I will very often uh, uh, think about F-theory in terms of type 2b. Uh, and that's appropriate when you have Calabio spaces that are elliptically fibered. So there's a torus vibration over a four-dimensional base. And then for most of my purposes, uh, we can think of type 2b uh, or, or this F-theory background as uh, this 10-dimensional background here. And depending on how you choose your Calabio, you can get various uh, four-dimensional surfaces, del pezzos and stuff like that. So a whole uh, mathematical literature about this. So... Um, this talk is going to be about black holes, so let me give a little bit of recap uh, of what has been done in the literature. These are not black holes we observe in the sky. They are, they are supersymmetric black holes, uh, 
And um, so this story essentially starts uh, in, in 96, uh, where Stroman Jirovafa wrote essentially uh, the paper explaining the black hole entropy of five-dimensional black holes using microscopics. And the model they started with uh, is type 2b string theory. First, you compactify it to six dimensions on T4 uh, or K3. Uh, so that gives you 2-2, two, 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 some people call it 4-4, four, four, six-dimensional supergravity. And so um, now you add brains to it, the D1, D5 system, and you take the D5 brain and you wrap it over the T4. That's a, that's a string-like object in, in six dimensions. And you can add a D1, that's also a string. So uh, from a point of view of supergravity, this will be a BPS supergravity solutions of the six-dimensional equations of motion. And I have not bothered to write it down here. Uh, I'll go into more supergravity details in the, in the second part of the talk. You can write down the supergravity solutions and look at the near horizon geometry, and you'll notice that it is uh, ADS3 cos S3. And then... Um, Stromage and Wafa were able to explain the entropy by using essentially ADS CFT. And the CFT here is a 4,4 CFT in two dimensions. And um, why is it 4? Well, there's many reasons why it's 4,4. But the fact that there is an S3 here, the S3 is, of course, uh, an isometry group which is SO4. The SO4 is two copies of SU2. And we know from the small n equals 4 superconformal algebra, there is SU2 current algebras. And so um, that all fits together. Um, so they also computed, of course, the central charges. And then you use Cardi formula in the conformal field theory to uh, match with the, um, um, the macroscopic entropy formula. So after that, there, of course, many papers were written. Uh, but one that is relevant for my story is that um, there were also, so these are five-dimensional black holes because we start from a string in six dimensions and then, I forgot to mention, take the string in six dimensions, then you compactify from six to five. You take the string, wrap it over the circle, and then you get a point-like object in five dimensions. That point-like object is, is, is the black hole. Of course, you need to write down the equations to show that. But, uh, I will do that later on in my F-theory context. So a year later... A little less than a year later, there was a, a construction of four-dimensional black holes uh, by Maldacena, Strominger, Witten. I'll abbreviate it as MSW. So you st this is similar in spirit, but the, um, um, the, the dimensions work differently. So we start compactifying M-theory on Calabria manifolds. We have less supersymmetry in this case. That's down to five dimensions. And then we take the M5 brain and wrap that over a four-dimensional cycle inside the Calabio. There's plenty of four cycles in there. And then you get a string in five dimensions. And um, then we are in, in N equals 2 five-dimensional supergravity. And this is a string-like object, a BPS, black string solution of uh, N equals 2 five-dimensional supergravity. You repeat the same trick, you compactify further on a circle, take the string, wrap it over the circle, you get a point-like uh, uh, BPS object in four dimensions. That's a black hole. And so the black string solution um, has a near horizon geometry that is ADS3 cross S2. Compared to the previous example had an S3, now we have an S2. The isometries of S2 is just a single SO3, so that translates into a single current algebra. And that is the current, the SU2 current here on the right moving sector uh, of the CFD. The left moving sector is not, uh, has no supersymmetry, but it's this bosonic conformal field theory that actually counts for the, um, for the entropy. So MSW computed the central charges of this conformal field theory. You use Cardi formula, you match with the supergravity expectations, and uh, that fits as well. So... Uh, motivated by this uh, and by an effort of me to learn a little bit what is F-theory, uh, I, I had a mini sabbatical I I in Harvard and uh, was asking questions, well, are there also black holes in F-theory? And so we wrote a, a paper together, uh, and the answer is actually yes. There is some literature that predates that. I will mention that uh, soon. So... Uh, we can think of F-theory compactified on Calabria three falls, or if you feel uncomfortable with the wording, you can think of it as type 2b. 
compactified on the base of this elliptically fibered uh, Calabio space. If you do that, then you end up with a 1-0 theory uh, in six dimensions. And again, we can take now uh, these three brains uh, and wrap it over two-dimensional cycles inside the Calabio. If you take a three-brain, wrap it over a two-dimensional thing, you get a, black str you get a string-like object again. String-like object is now a uh, BPS object, not in a 2-2 theory, like Sturm and Javafa, but in a theory which much less supersymmetry, becomes more interesting, uh, um, uh, but also more difficult. And uh, again, there is an ADS 3 cos S3 uh, uh, near horizon geometry, um, uh, but there is less supersymmetry. And so from many points of view, it looks a little bit more like the M-theory setup, where we have a 0-4, on the other hand, there is still the S3 near horizon, uh, or the S3 factor, yielding an isometry group SO4 cross SO4, uh, sorry, uh, SO4, which is SU2 cross SU2. So what we're, what we're the F theory yields you uh, is, is uh, an SU2 current algebra in the left moving sector as well. And so this is not dictated by supersymmetry, but it appears from the geometry here. So if you have a current algebra there, you need to know and compute not only the central charges, but also the levels of these, uh, of these current uh, algebras, the Katz-Moody levels or affine levels. And uh, so, so that's what I said before. So how does the black hole arise? So we take a D3 brain. Inside the Calabio, there's lots of Riemann surfaces or two cycles. And so we wrap it over this curve. And then um, you get a black string. Uh, we get, in fact, the, uh, the, the levels uh, of the current algebra in the left-moving sector. We compute it uh, uh, in that paper, and it turns out to be equal to the genus of the curve that the, that the D3 brain uh, wraps over or wraps around. So we get this black string here, and if you compactify again on a circle, wrap the string over the circle, you get a five-dimensional spinning black hole. You get a five-dimensional spinning black hole, and... Um, the central charges actually were with a bunch of tricks that uh, Kumon forgot himself. He wrote a paper in '97 about it. Um, he determined actually the central charges uh, um, for this setup, and it's given by the genus of this curve. And then there is, uh, well, the intersection between the, the, the first Schoen class of the base uh, intersected with the curve itself. And if you want to rewrite this in terms of charges, what this really means is that C dot C is just quadratic in the charges. These are the black hole charges. And this is uh, 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 linear in the black hole charge times stuff that has to do with the topology of the uh, uh, well, churn class of the base. OK. So what it also means is that even you can forget about the black holes there uh, or take out the black hole, but just consider the background. Uh, a geometry uh, defining this uh, type 2b theory, and it leads to a new ADS CFT duality where type 2b on this background here uh, is dual to a two dimensional 0 4 uh, conformal field theory with the central charges and the levels um, um, as I wrote uh, before. So that's a new ADS CFT. We don't know very much about this conformal field theory, but we had some examples where, for instance, uh, besides the central charges, we could, could compute the elliptic, uh, elliptic uh, uh, genus, uh, uh, etc. Good. So um, that was. Is there some constructions of this kind of theories by Google and Dante? Is there any relation with uh, the class of theories that you can start? Um, no. I think the, the, the closest connection. Uh, uh, you, I have to look up these papers, but m most of them were like uh, having a slightly different setups where you take a D3 brain and wrap it over different cycles in, in sometimes different manifolds, sometimes even Calabria four folds were done. I don't know if it's in that paper, but the closest it gets to is a paper by Martucci, uh, who, um, uh, so we're playing with D3 brains here, they wrap cycles, so you've got N equals four super young mills, compactified on this Riemann surface, you have to topologically twist it and then construct the conformal field theory in the infrared, and this way he could also uh, tell things about uh, uh, this model. So that's, that's uh, uh, Martucci, Luca Martucci, yeah. So the, there are seven brains in this story. There are seven brains in this story, yes. Very good, um, very good. 
Very good. Um, if you do what Martucci was doing and you construct this uh, uh, conformal field theory using just D3 brains, and then you go, you compactly fine, you try to compute the central charge from that by just counting degrees of freedom, you, you get this term, uh, but you don't get the, the right factors here. And you don't get the right factors, and that's because there's contributions from the D7 brains. If you want to compute them using F-theory techniques itself, nobody has actually really done it. The way Wafa did it in 97 was dualize back into M-theory, use M5 brain stories, MSW, and some clever Wafa tricks, and then uh, he got there. Um, and so there's no F-theory derivation of this answer to a degree that uh, I think yeah, we are com feeling comfortable with. Uh, there's some work by uh, uh, Martelli and... Um, Sakura, uh, Shafran Ameki, uh, and they, 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 they are almost there. Well, you, know, uh, you can read the papers to see whether that's a proof of this formula or not using only F-theory ingredients. And so the computation, uh, um, including the D7 brain corrections to the central charges, uh, has not been done on the nose. Uh, so you make detours into M-theory. Yeah. about the spectrum and so on? Um, well, what is known about the spectrum? Um, well, that's w what I was trying to... Uh, um, uh, I'm not entirely sure if I mean what you mean. Uh, are, are you thinking about the, yeah. the, the world volume theory of type 2b on this, on this background? Uh, so, where was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's something uh, maybe we should talk to, uh, about because you probably know much more about it than I do. Um, and so there, uh, I, I don't know if there is a good sigma model. <laughs> of course, F-theory is not just type 2B, uh, even not on that base. And so the, 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 I'm, I'm not, you can probably write down these sigma models and try to see whether there is for instance, integrable structures there. I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether that's the right thing to do. And you will probably hit into the fact that, uh, well, you need to include the brains and the D7 brains, and uh, maybe you can just do that using type 2B language. But yeah, or, or, or Dave can probably give a better answer to this. Uh. So presumably, you want the central charge to be large to match with the supergravity? Uh, yes. So what is it large in this formula, sir? Uh, the Q, or the genus. Um, so there's some relation between the genus and the charges, but the charges should be large also to match with supergravity. So you should take a look at curves that have a high genus. Uh, yeah. Okay, so these are five-dimensional black holes, and um, um, they're well using the levels and the, and the central charges. You compute the entropy here. You see that the level, the SU2 level in the, in the non-supersymmetric sector, uh, arises here. This is the spin of the black hole, the angular momentum. This is the central charge. This is the, the momentum along the string, uh, and that's the eigenvalue of L0. And of course, you need this to be positive, and that's uh, uh, the cosmic censorship saying that the angular momentum uh, cannot be too large. Uh, that's a known story. So, um, so after 2015, we, we sort of had a sufficient control over five-dimensional black holes in F-theory. So then we wondered, like, can you also make four-dimensional black holes uh, from F-theory? And here, uh, the answer is yes. And so that is the recent paper that I did with uh, Thomas Grimm and Herbert Lamm, a student of mine, Kilian Meyer, and myself. Uh, this is only two months old. And so we're going to make use of the, of the same trick uh, 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 or the same fact. We're going to use this top nut geometry. So we're going to take these D3 brains, but instead of having them live in asymptotically flat space, I'm going to have them live in a space time that uh, contains a top nut factor. And if you're close to the origin of top nut, it looks like a five dimensional black hole because top nut is, looks like R4. Uh, uh, close to the origin, and the origin will be where I place the black hole. So then that would be R4 times S1, and that's the, the story that I was talking about before. However, if you go to the asymptotic region of a top nut, you basically get a circle. You get a, there's, there's a circle vibration, and so you get a circle. You can use that circle to compactify one dimension uh, um, uh, um, further to four dimensions. And that then uh, gives you a four-dimensional uh, black hole uh, geometry. You can translate that back into M-theory language, uh, and, but I, I, I won't do that. So 
Um, the top nut geometry, however, um, will break the SU2 cross SU2 into U1 cross SU2 because uh, the R4 uh, is replaced by top nut, and so the <coughs> SU2 cross SU2 has, uh, 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 has now U1 cross SU2. And this uh, turns out to be the SU2 from the, the left moving sector is broken to U1, and the SU2 from the right moving sector is, uh, is untouched. So essentially, this is an implementation of a well-known uh, uh, trick that is called, well, trick, it's not a trick, I use the word trick too often. Uh, this is a variation of a theme or a correspondence, 45D correspondence, that uh, uh, I think the first paper is by Gayoto Strominger Yin, but many people here, uh, uh, of course, uh, worked on, on, on this. There's many uh, large literature um, um, and, and we're doing this now uh, applied to uh, F-theory um, background. So, um, yes? The S2 that survives, you say, is in the bosonic sector or supersymmetric sector? That's in the supersymmetric sector, yeah. Isn't that a bit surprising because the U1 is the one that's triholomorphic, whereas the SU2 is not. They rotate the complex. Um... No, it's precisely the reason. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, if you try to solve the supergravity equations of motions, which I will uh, show in, in a minute, then you have again a similar situation. Uh, we start with a D three brain, wrap it over the circle. You get a six dimensional black string solution in six dimensional supergravity, and the new horizon geometry is ADS three cos S three. But now, because of the top nut uh, geometry, uh, you have to quotient by uh, uh, ZM. And this breaks the isometries uh, into U1 cross SU2. And, uh, well, I made this uh, statement before. And we want to play with this parameter M, the nut charge, uh, because the central charges um, uh, will, in fact, also depend on M now. And that's a new parameter, and we want to uh, study how the um, entropy, or in other words, the central charges and the level, will depend on M. Now, um, micros there's two calculations always. Uh, we do something microscopically in string theory. We do something macroscopically in supergravity. And so microscopically, the central charges and the levels have already been computing, again, using tricks by going to M theory. I, I won't go through that because it will not be uh, relevant for my talk. Um, Bena, Diaconescu, and Florian actually studied this uh, and used MSW, Maldacena Strominger, written techniques to compute and determine the levels. And here you see the formulas, quite a bit more complicated than when there was uh, just a flat transverse uh, R4 instead of top nut. And you see that the, the dependence on M uh, is, uh, is non trivial. There's terms that, well, are linear in M, quadratic, cubic, uh, there's terms without M. Uh, and so this is the formula for the left-moving central charge. Uh, so the C is, again, the curve that self-intersects and is basically quadratic in the black hole charges that existed before, but now I have a new charge, the nut charge. And so the level of the U1 uh, current algebra on the uh, left-moving sector is given by, by this formula. And so basically the answer is known from these people. Um, and... Um, what we want to do here is, um, and what I want to show uh, in somewhat more detail, is to derive these formulas macroscopically using supergravity uh, techniques. So um, if you look at these formulas again, you see that some terms are cubic in the, center, in the charges. This is quadratic in the, in, the, in the charges, black hole charges. Now there's the nut charge, so this is cubic, cubic, cubic. And these are linear terms. This is just uh, information about the, the Calabio or the base in the Calabio. This is linear the charge, linear, linear. So these are the leading terms, and these are subleading terms. And so we want to do a supergravity calculation that uh, produces both leading terms and, non and subleading terms. Uh, typically, leading terms arise from two derivative supergravity, and subleading terms arise from higher derivative uh, terms in the supergravity action. And that will play an important role. Good. So what are we going to do? So we're going to derive this macroscopically, 
And so um, the, way to, the way that is done is a, is a, a well-known technique, at least for those who have studied a little bit. Uh, we're going to take six-dimensional supergravity, and we're going to compactify it on this uh, space, which is the near-horizon geometry of the, uh, um, of the black hole. So we compactify it into three dimensions, and we get a bunch of churn simon terms in three dimensions. And the coefficients in front of the churn simon terms, I will go through it in somewhat more detail, they determine the levels and the central charges. So for instance, there will be gauge fields arising in three dimensions coming from the um, uh, S3 compactification, and they will determine the coefficients in front of those churn simon terms will determine the, um, uh, the levels. And there is another gravitational churn simon term coming from the spin connection. The coefficients in front of those terms will uh, give me the central charge. Actually, it will give me the difference of C left minus C right. OK, so now I switch a little bit towards more supergravity part of the discussion. Um, so it's known that um, the, uh, Wafa and, and, uh, and, and Dave Morrison, already in 96, sort of worked out was the spectrum of the theory if you compactify F theory on Calabio. So you get a chiral uh, six dimensional supergravity theory with matter fields uh, and the number, you get tensor fields, of course you get the Poincare multiplet, and, on, and the matter fields are, you get tensor multiplets, vector multiplets, and hyper multiplets. And they are determined by the Hodge numbers of the Calabio or of the base of the Calabio. And um, for simplicity, we're going to take uh, a situation where there is no vector multiplet. It's not such an important uh, uh, assumption. It's more for, for, uh, uh, for simplicity. Um, so the bosonic part of the supergravity uh, Lagrangian in six dimension looks something like this. So we have the Einstein-Hilbert term. Then we get a bunch of tensors, uh, and the field strength of this is it's not quite G, but uh, let's say it is G. You compute from it, uh, you compute from the tensor G, but G also contains other terms such that the B, well, I'll get there. Let's say these are the tensor multiplets. These are the scalar fields in the tensor multiplet. So a tensor multiplet in uh, 1, 0 in six dimensions has a, either a self-dual or an anti-self-dual uh, tensor. Uh, and that's all packaged in these Gs. And then in a tensor multiplet, there are scalar fields. They're called J. Then there's hypermultiplets, Q. And there's a metric here, H, which is a quaternion Kähler metric, but it, it will not play an important role. There is a metric here in front of the scalar fields. Uh, the supergravity experts know there is SO1, N uh, uh, symmetry here. And this metric G is, uh, can be computed. Oh. Oh, this does work. Yeah. Um, so G is given by, uh, by this formula here, and eta is just the uh, uh, term. So, uh, the, the, yes, Bernard? Then you have something which is the microscopic formula. Yes. You don't have higher derivative terms. No, here is a higher derivative term. Uh, so this is a green Schwartz term, which is for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this will play an important role. I put it in red because I'm first going to do the analysis on these terms, and then I'm going to do it on this term. Uh, so this is the green Schwarz uh, term in six dimensions. It's uh, well known already. I don't know who was it first. Maybe it was Ferrara, Sarniotti, uh, uh, or maybe even earlier. Um, it's sometimes called green Schwarz Sarniotti. Green Schwarz Sarniotti. Uh, I think that's, that's probably. Uh, I think that's probably correct. Uh, yeah. And so, um, so this is the tensor. These are the tensors B, uh, and this is of course the uh, 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 trace of uh, R, which R. The C's are the same C's as coming from the, um, uh, the first churn class. So the first churn class is, is, a, is a two form. You can expand that into uh, the, the, the two forms you have on the Calabio. It comes with coefficients. And the, these are the C's. Yes. And so this is the, the, the starting point of the supergravity analysis. Um, and in that theory, we can already, leaving out the higher derivative terms for the moment, we can um, look for a BPS, black string solution. And here it is. Um, so let me talk uh, you through. So we have a string. A string has world sheet coordinates, if you want. They are u and v. Uh, and then we're in six dimensions. So there's also a transverse space to the string. That is the top nut geometry. I've chosen it to be top nut. I could have ch chosen it to be R4, but then I will never get 40 black holes. I can also t t take, actually, we're working on this now, can take any hyperkähler space there. 
And so one of the things I'm interested in now is to take, for instance, the, not the top nut geometry, but the, uh, one of the other uh, asymptotically ALF spaces. And so then you even break the U1 isometry down to nothing. And then uh, that becomes interesting because now, uh, that's a side remark, if you don't have that U1 isometry, you don't have a circle anymore. If you don't have a circle, you lose also the duality to M theory. And so that's a, a, new, a new situation. Uh, but for this talk, I will use the top nut geometry. So we have harmonic functions in the game. And um, they are labeled by H1 here, is there? Um, there's also an H5 that's also a harmonic function. This is a harmonic function on, uh, uh, not on top nut, but top nut has a as an R3 factor, and this is a, a harmonic function in three dimensions. And um, so that's what H is, the square root of this. Um, of course, there is the, the charges of the string. The string are, is charged. Uh, and then there's the scalar fields, and the scalar fields are determined by uh, the ratio of these harmonic functions. So there's, a, there's, a, there's also an attractor mechanism in six dimensions that follows basically from this equation. Namely, that the scalar fields, the tensor, f the scalars in the tensor uh, uh, multiplet, they are fixed in terms of the, uh, the charges here. And so this H1, for instance, is a harmonic function. It starts with a constant and then a charge divided by R, and this is that charge. So there's an attractor mechanism also on uh, these six-dimensional black strings, and um, there's more in our paper about this if you're interested. So... So here is the black string solution, and we could say, okay, the near horizon geometry, you can compute it by taking r to be small. You will find it's ADS3 cross S3, mod ZM, that's all good. And now I say, okay, I have the horizon, I compute its, uh, its area, and that's the back and sign Hawking. And so doesn't that produce the right entropy? And the answer is no. Uh, and how come? Well, there's two reasons. Uh, um, one is, of course, I didn't, we didn't include the Green-Schwartz term. So we know already there's lots of papers. Bernard has uh, uh, made uh, major contributions to how higher derivative terms correct the beckenstein hawking entropy precisely in the subleading terms. But that's not the only thing here. There will be something that uh, uh, has to, is related to loop effects, and I will explain that because that's the really interesting thing, I think, in our project. The rest is basically repeating what other people did in a somewhat more complicated setting. So, um, good. So, the supergravity calculation is a three-step calculation. One is the reduction of the two-derivative supergravity action to three dimensions. Um, two is the same, well, or is the reduction of the, uh, of the higher derivative term to three dimensions. And the third is something that is sort of uh, is new, and that is that um, we have chiral fields in six dimensions, and we're going to compute, or we're going to compactify down to three dimensions. We're going to compute churn simons uh, terms, or coefficients in front of the churn simons terms. Now, it's well known uh, to many people in the audience that if you have chiral fields, uh, if they are massive, we're talking about the Kaluza Klein Tower, if you, you let them run in the loop, uh, they will contribute to the um, churn simons levels in, in three dimensions. And so we're going to have to take this into account, and uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit more in detail what this step three is and how that works. Good. Step one is sort of easy, but uh, here's some notation. So we take the two derivative level. You, uh, it's standard technology. It's a bit of, uh, I don't go into too many details here. So we take the one zero six dimensional theory. We reduce on S3 mod ZM, and so, um, like in any spherical compactification, you get gauge fields out of the symmetries of the sphere. In this case, there are U1 cos SU2, because there's the, we modded out ZM. And so um, if you do these calculations, you generate three-dimensional churn simons terms. In the left-moving sector, we have a U1. That's here, a churn simons term. comes with a K left in front, or it comes with a coefficient, and we have to compute this coefficient. And then there is a non-abelian churn simons term coming from the SU2 in the right-moving sector, and that comes with a coefficient that we call, uh, that is k right. And so you do this explicitly, uh, because we have the uh, supergravity solution. And so what you get if you do this exercise is that you compute the coefficients, you get 
left and right are equal and they are given a quadratic in the, in, the, in, the, in the charges here of the black hole. And there is the nut parameter, the nut charge M arising in this formula. Similarly for uh, C left and C right, actually because in the right moving sector we have N equals 4 supersymmetry and then it's an identity that C is equal to 6 times K. And because there's no gravitational anomaly at the level of two derivative terms, C left and C right must be equal, so everything is fixed here. Okay, that's step one that is standard in the literature. Step two is also sort of standard if you at least have some expertise. Um, you have to do higher derivative terms and, and reduce them to three dimensions. And so what we're interested here in is not only the same Chern-Simons terms, uh, for the gauge fields, but also the gravitational churn simons uh, term will now be switched on. So if you go through this uh, uh, calculation, the details are in our paper, you, you obtain a three-dimensional Lagrangian, Lagrangian density, or the form, uh, uh, which is of this type here. Here we see the, um, the churn simons uh, term of the, of the spin connection. Here is the churn simons term of the right-moving uh, gauge fields. Uh, and there's no correction coming, uh, for, there's no correction or there's no contribution to the churn simons term of the U1 in the left moving sector. So K left is not corrected at four derivative level, but K right is corrected um, at four derivative uh, level. And there's this additional contribution um, that uh, one has to add to, um, to, this, to this term here. Furthermore, uh, the coefficient in front of the uh, churn simons the gravitational churn simons term, well, it's given by this formula here, up to a numerical factor, that determines C left minus C right. You have to know a little bit the dictionary between ADS3 and CFT2, but uh, what uh, arises in front of the uh, churn simons term is C left minus C right divided by 96. So 6 times 16 is 96, so that's why there's a factor of 6 over here. So then you would think, like, uh, well, that's it, we're done. We have the classical term, the two derivative term. We have the higher derivative uh, terms. And so if we add this up, we should be done because this exercise was done many times before when there was more supersymmetry. And uh, uh, that basically, well, maybe there are still some puzzles left over, but that basically uh, gives you the leading and subleading terms. You see, these are linear in, this, in the charges. Uh, and the two derivative terms are cubic in the central charges. So that, that fits the bill. However, it's not the right answer. Uh, yeah. You write four derivative, it was four derivative and 60, but it was not... Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. Uh, yeah, this is four derivatives coming from R, which are in six dimensions, yes. Yeah, now it's just... Yeah, now it's just John Simons in three dimensions, yeah. So it contributes to the same kind of terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, it's a bit confusing, perhaps, the way I wrote it here, yeah. Yeah. So these terms talk to each other, yes? Uh, this term was also there in the previous transparency. Uh, well, I guess you could argue that the gravitational term is the in terms of the metric. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but the, the, this one is a bit more confusing. Okay, so the third step is integrating out the uh, massive Kaluza Klein mode. So here you have to do, I could almost give a separate uh, seminar about it. Um, um, you have to do the Kaluza Klein spectroscopy uh, when you compactify, let's say, the um, uh, massless six dimensional fields on a three sphere. Uh, so there's a lot of group theory, and here this is a little bit of a, a additional complication because we're not compactifying on S3, but S3 mod ZM. So you have to throw out certain states, uh, but we know which states to keep. So you play with the group theory of J left and J right, uh, and then only certain values of, of the spins, uh, J left and J right, uh, survive the orbifold projection. And we sort of know how, how that works. Now... Uh, Using, well, literature goes quite back uh, to the 80s, w w not all massive states uh, uh, contribute to the three-dimensional churn simons uh, terms. But uh, let me, here's a list of, uh, of, of the fields that do uh, 
that do contribute to the three-dimensional churn Simon terms. First of all, we have six all the chiral massless matter in six dimensions will contribute to the churn Simon uh, terms in, in, in three dimensions. So let's go through the list. So we have tensor multiplets. They have tensors and scalars. The scalars, uh, um, they don't uh, contribute. Uh, but the self-dual tensors or anti-self-dual tensor, remember in the Poincaré multiplet there is an anti-self-dual tensor and in the tensor multiplets there are the self-dual tensors and you have to carefully distinguish and take that uh, into account. If you um, compactify that to three dimensions using Kaluza-Klein, you basically get 3D massive Kaluza-Klein. We call them chiral vectors. Uh, and what we really mean is explained in this paper that the... Uh, um, um, it, it, the, the, the title of the paper is, is Self-Duality in Odd Dimensions. And so the kind of uh, fields that you get in three dimensions are massive gauge fields, and they satisfy some equation uh, like, uh, so we are in three dimensions. The field strength F is, is a two-form. Take the star of it, that's a one-form. Uh, and that is equal to the mass times the gauge field itself. That is, uh, I think, Peter, uh, yeah. So those, you get a, you get a whole tower of that. And all of them, all of them can run into into the loop and contribute to the churn simons uh, uh, term. So that's one tower of states that uh, are important in this calculation. Then uh, that's why we're doing supergravity. The fermions do something here. The hyperini here come into the game because they have scalars don't contribute, but the hyperini, they are chiral chiral fields. They will contribute. They will um, reduce to three-dimensional massive spin one-half particles. And so they will have not only mass, but also charge. If you do it in terms of Feynman diagrams, you, 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 you look at Feynman diagrams with two uh, external uh, bosons. These are the, the, the gauge fields. Uh, and then something is running into the loop, but to have a non-trivial vertex, the particle must be charged. And, and because of supersymmetry, the charge and the mass are related. And so um, they, will, they, they will contribute uh, to this calculation. And so uh, um, for each massive spin one-half fermion, you will get a contribution to the uh, churn simons terms or the levels. And then, um, and similarly for the Gravitino. And um, if you do the Kaluza-Klein reduction over the sphere, you will get uh, three-dimensional massive spin three-half fields, an infinite tower of them. And each member of the tower will contribute to the... Uh, to the churn simons levels. And so you will, have, uh, you will have to sum that. That, of course, needs to be regularized. Uh, and here we made use, again, of literature that was, uh, 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 this is actually really, you can do the Feynman diagram calculation, but you can also do, uh, this is also related to the parity anomaly. And that parity anomaly can be computed using index theorems, Atia, Patori, and Singer. And in fact, uh, um, um, there is some literature here, uh, a very important paper uh, by Alvarez Gourmet, De La Pietra, and more. I actually only realized before lunch that th this De La Pietra is the one that, that, that uh, Eric told me this morning. And, th and then now I realize, like, hey, that, that, that must be. I don't know. Was at that time Alvarez Gourmet here, maybe in 84? No. It's the same Alvarez Gourmet that is now here, but <laughs> at 85. De La Pietra was his student. De La Pietra was his student, yeah, I see. Very good. Anyway, these people did a lot of work uh, in terms of index calculations, computing the anomaly, especially for spin th one half and spin three half. And uh, we, we kind of uh, generalized this index theorem a little bit. This one is a little bit more tricky. And that, that paper, well, maybe the paper is it's an easy extension, but we, we extended this. Maybe it was it's a trivial extension uh, um, uh, to include also the, the, uh, the index for um, uh, spin one uh, fields. So uh, you compute that anomaly, or if you want to, to do it uh, using Feynman diagrams, equally fine. You have to uh, sum over all the fields. That's infinite, of course. You do zeta functional regularization, and that uh, gives you the right answer. <laughs> uh, because we know the right answer from our friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, OK, so um, probably yes. But um, this, not this, this, this thing here, but, but people have been computing or, or do circle compactifications in F-theory. 
um, uh, to, to, to test the duality between M theory and F theory. You have to compactify on a circle. You have to sum over Kaluza Klein states there as well. Nothing to do with black holes or anything. And then in order to make the duality work, you, of course, you can always choose regularization scheme, whatever you like, if you include the right counter terms and different schemes come with different counter terms. Um, if you use this regularization scheme, you get it on the nose. Um, it works. It works. Well, anything works. Uh, without, yeah, without, without any, any other things you have to do. Yeah, that's right. Very good. So that is uh, uh, essentially the story. So if you do this, um, then, um, and you sum up uh, the, the contribution from all these modes, then you get a result that uh, contributes here, there's corrections to k left here, m cube. So this is again, this, so this is a term that contributes to leading order uh, in the level. So this is again, there were cubic terms and there were linear terms. This is a cubic term here, contributing to uh, 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 k left. And here is the contribution to k right. And this is again a contribution to the gravitational anomaly, because also the coefficient in front of the gravitational churn Simons term will get corrected by integrating out all that loop stuff. And this is a kind of new ingredient into black hole physics. Basically, all the ingredients were done, uh, well, sometimes decades ago, but we have to put it all together uh, and then uh, uh, work, work things out. Yeah, yeah. Do you have more supersymmetry? Do these things just cancel out? Or is that yes. For instance, uh, yes, I should, that's a very important uh, remark. Suppose you would do this, uh, let's say, in, in Strominger Waffe, and we do type 2b on k3. Uh, so then essentially, uh, uh, the, 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 we don't have Calabias, but we have k3, and the base is then replaced by the k3. But c1 of k3 is 0. So all these terms are not there. And so there's, it's much less interesting from that point of view. Well, it's more, more dependent what you call interesting. But um, so you get. So let me let me show you the the uh, the full result from Bena and, and so on. You see, there's many terms here that have this first churn class of the base. All these terms are absent if you do the Strominger Waffe K3 or T4 case. And so the test is, if you would do the calculations there, the test is is uh, yeah is is, is is not so strong as here because we have here all these terms here that. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right, that's right. So it's still there. There's still a calculation to be done, uh, but it's 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 more rich, let's say. Uh, so, but had that been missed, or? I don't quite understand. Um, well. I have a question. Is people before you? Yes realize that they need not do loops? Or is it because it is where you went to the literature and thought what on earth can resolve this non-agreement? OK, so if you do, l let me see if I get this right. If you do, let's say, k3, so uh, then uh, this term is not there, that term is not there, that term is not there. But this term is there. But people, people only look not at tope nut, but uh, at m equals 1, then this is a constant. And constants people never bother to do, because it wasn't scaling with the charges. And so, but here you don't get away with this argument because here you have, well, this, this M is multiplying a charge. And so people, people didn't bother about, well, yes. Okay. Because I still ask, did anybody before you entertain the possibility that in some models you need further correction? Yes, but never a paper was written about it because, well, they entertain the possibilities. Because these are constant terms. Now, in ADS-CFT, th th that's already yeah, <coughs> a little bit. I'm not sure I can explain this uh, very, very uh, carefully. Numerical constant contributions to the central charges. I don't think ever, anybody has ever really done a macroscopic, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody in the audience. Uh, the yeah. square, square minus 1. Already in ADS five times five was actually concluded by very similar method. Yeah. Like That's maybe one example, yes. But uh, if I do the black holes, then uh, indeed you get here a factor of twelve or six, and that six has never been pr uh, produced. We had long email exchange with Ashok Sen also. That constant term there was never uh, reproduced using supergravity. But maybe it can be done very similarly to here, but people have just not done it because, well, I don't know why. 
Well, the MSW case was different because they had a leading behavior across quadratically different charges, and then you have the constant. Yes. In MSMLU, there is no constant. There is a cubic term and there is a linear term. No. Yes. No. no. MSW uh, central charges are uh, cubic. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the entropy. Ah, but that, that's uh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There is something proportional. Yeah, but I'm I'm talking here about the central charges yeah, itself. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, of course, the C left is multiplied in the Cardi formula with the momentum, and that's still linear in the charge, but I'm, I'm really talking about the constant in the central charge. Uh, yeah. Good. So, so then, we, then we agree. Okay. Um, where are we? I think we're essentially done. So, we've computed all the contributions. Um, and so, we've computed all the contributions. When you end them up, then you can compare with the microscopic results. And uh, now you still need a little bit of dictionary because the macroscopic charges are called capital Q. The microscopic uh, charges are called uh, small q. And there's a dictionary between them. It's given by this formula. But that's not something that we read off by matching it. It has a separate explanation. Uh, essentially, the explanation uh, is given by uh, this, uh, uh, in, in this paper. So then we have done a non-trivial test here. Uh, we have produced four-dimensional black holes from uh, F-theory, and we've computed the, the entropy to leading and subleading order. And so the ingredients are not just classical supergravity and higher derivative terms, but also this one-loop uh, Kaluza-Klein uh, states. And, and that is sort of like uh, um, the end result of uh, our, our recent paper. Okay, I still have a, a, a few minutes uh, I, I, of course, this stuff is, is not really something that um, <clears throat> I worked on with Martin, but uh, I, I still want to <clears throat> stress and emphasize uh, that, that um, how much I, I learned, actually, from Martin. <clears throat> the work that we uh, uh, um, uh, did together when I was postdoc here had lots to do with hypermultiplet moduli spaces, uh, hyperkähler cones. We had a great collaboration also with Bernard here, wrote some papers. And um, then, uh, well, we continued in uh, quite some adventure about, uh, well, what are the quantum corrections to hypermultiplet modular space. And altogether, we wrote uh, eight papers. So this, these are, are, are in more chronological order. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so all the way, uh, yeah, over, over a time span of, uh, yeah, I think uh, almost, uh, almost 10 years. So I, I, <clears throat> I, greatly, uh, I greatly enjoyed that. And um, yeah. I wanted to thank you also for the great time we had together here and also afterwards, not just only about physics, but also <clears throat> about life, jokes, laughter, and uh, especially the great inspiration you gave me. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. I, I would have an answer. I don't know if the answer satisfies you, but the ambiguity is fixed by requiring that M and F theory are, are dual to each other, uh, uh, because F theory on a circle must reproduce M theory. And that means that if you integrate out stuff in the loop, uh, then, then you should be consistent with M, uh, M theory considerations. And so if you do that with, with zeta function realization, you, you, get, you get the right matching uh, straight away. Again, you can use any other scheme, but then you have to do probably more non-trivial stuff to get the right matching uh, between M and F theory. Maybe there's different ways of saying this, but uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, picking your scheme or regularization is, let's say, a human choice. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm emotionally uh, not attached to any regularization scheme. Uh, well, it, it looks like you are. I mean. yeah, no, that, that's, that's not emotional. That's very practical. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
So am I right that there's identification of the charges that you have to make at the end? You did not do twice as yet from the action, or is there some, I mean, there must be some unique prescription that sort of right. Yes, that, that goes again with the MF theory duality. So um, if you M theory in Calabio, you get a bunch of vector fields. Uh, uh, and and also charges you can relate them to the M theory charges, uh, and. But you show the conjunction, doesn't it immediately follow from the uh, action what the charge should yeah. be? That's capital Q. Um, capital Q, but how it's related to the small yeah. Q and the M? Well, small Q is a microscopic charge that was that was introduced using M the, these are uh, M five brain charges uh, after you dualize F theory no, to M theory. You know, or the green swatch. Yes. Uh, that already should shift the definition of charge simply by how you. Yes, it does. Yeah. Shouldn't that be the same shift? That is the same shift as well, yes. Okay. yes. But that would yeah. be derivation from the Lagrange. <coughs> You're probably right, yes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I think they. Well, there's probably different ways of doing this, uh, the, uh, deriving the, the same formula. I, I, I gave one explanation again by. Comparing with the microscopic uh, M theory charges. But because it shifts the, the definition of electric charge. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure that gives the, right, the same answer, yes. Yeah. You said you have to analyze this in the case where you do not have any one. Yes. Yeah. But then we don't have M theory. We don't have a prediction then, yes. And yeah. then you don't have a microscopic count. Yes. So this is an interesting set. We, we only started thinking about this. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, like, hey, we should play with the with the with the D series instead of the A series, uh, and so uh, what we know. So what you need to know in order to do this calculation, it suffices to know the asymptotic form of the metric uh, to do this reduction. But that that asymptotic form, uh, I think, is known. I'm also looking at uh, Nigel Hitch. The asymptotic form of the metric uh, of the D series is is known also, and that's all I need to to do this calculation. I can explain you why, but. Uh, yeah, well, since you're looking at the ALS case, I mean, these things are generalizations of THH, and they're all known. Yeah, the asymptotic form is known, yeah. Yeah, yeah th th yes, but it, 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 it's, it's hard. The metrics are known using twister space, uh, but, but here I need sort of supergravity coordinates, and uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe just a good, it would be nice to discuss this further, yes. But isn't it in string theory? Doesn't it amount to some orientable? Yes, it's a... It's a Yes, that's right. It's a, that's papers by Sen and D six O six planes. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you proved the uh, Jacquel equation, I had the feeling that you only did it for the two derivative parts. Yes. So did you need? Didn't you need another Jacquel equation for what was happening in the other sector of the Lagrange? Very good. Uh, no, no, we didn't. Uh, probably you, you, that that needs to be. Uh, um, yes, we should do it. Yeah. Yes, that is important. Yes, yeah, yeah. We haven't studied the attractor mechanism uh, in in much uh, greater detail beyond two derivative level, um, because the reason why we don't do it is that the supergravity solution, even if you add a higher derivative term, is not going to give you the right object, because you somehow need to take into account these all these loop corrections. And so that will contribute as well. Yeah, that's, some, completely that's completely different, yes. But you could still ask the question, and, and, and the answer is we, we have not looked at the track. The supersymmetry of this black hole, is it? It's one half BPS. Yeah. Globally, one half BPS. So the horizon is, is supersymmetric. Yes, yeah. Because then it should have been Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you, that's right, yeah. yeah. Well, you are more experienced with all the higher. For me, this was already uh, difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any further questions? If not, let's. Thank you.